All right, welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. So we have a pre-recorded session today as I'm not going to be able to make it live for our normal time, which is 3 p.m. Eastern every Wednesday. So we're releasing this recording at the same time and hopefully you all can follow along. So the point of the show is that for us to all gather together and draw together. So you can see this owl, that's what we're gonna be working on today. I'll be working in graphite. So I have um, three pencils, I've chosen F, then I have a 6B and an 8B. So really the 6B and the 8B are very similar to one another. They're both very soft, very dark. Um, and I have two of them in case I really need to kind of shift between them. But if you don't have that full range, anything in that dark range should work for you. And then something in this middle range, like a, like this F, all right? Um, now for uh, erasers, I have my rubber eraser here, this retractable one for some of the finer details, my kneaded eraser when I need some broad areas covered, and of course, my trusty blending stump. So before we get started though, I do wanna give a shout out to Bill and Liz Miller. So happy birthday, Liz, and thank you, Bill, for providing this. So this came via Margo. Again, I wanna thank you for sending this, and it's a kind of a special uh, episode here for you, Liz, for your birthday. So um, if anybody has a, a subject that they would like me to draw for drawing together, I'll do what I can. So send me a photo. Um, we'll see if we can uh, incorporate that into the schedule here. So again, thank you, Margo, for making this happen. Um, okay. So for today, uh, I'm working on a uh, rag paper. This is the Legion the Pesha um, rag paper that I have here, and I'll put that in the description below. Um, this is size to a, about an eight by 10. The reference image should be about that same size, but you can see that I'm working horizontally here versus the vertical in the, the reference image. You can see what I have below. I kind of cropped it a little bit more. So the reference image really is just to provide a reference. We're gonna kind of go where this drawing leads us. So it may not um, fit um, specifically to the, the, the reference image. So I may um, play around with the background to do some abstract things, play around with the composition a little bit. Again, we're just kind of starting with this reference image and you're gonna see where it goes. So if you're following along in graphite, awesome, charcoal, whatever medium you want to use um, and then also look in the description below you're going to find a link to the page where you can share your work on artist network so go to artist network and you can see all of the past episodes this is episode 101 last week we had our 100th episode so um, pretty wild uh, so uh, generally when i get started uh, before i have a live session I, um, I practice, I do a preparatory version of the drawing and I'm not doing that here. So I'm kind of coming into it blind. Um, I don't really know what I wanna do for this drawing. So part of what this episode is about is kind of feeling our way through a, uh, through a drawing. Uh, I do kind of know that I, I want to be a little bit uh, kind of loose with that background um, so just kind of compositionally, I want things to be fairly loose and then bring into a center of focus. So I'll figure out which aspect of the owl I want to be the primary focus. And so um, as I get started here, I'm just building up multiple layers of cross hatching using the slightly harder graphite. Um, and you can see that I've taken a razor blade and I, I like to, to sharpen my pencils this way to expose more of that core to give me a broad area um, to, to cover these areas. And so. Um, rather than using the point of the, or the tip of the pencil, I'm using the side of it to give a slightly more broad mark and also one that doesn't quite emboss the page as much. So um, part of this early, uh, these early stages is also about um, just kind of warming up. I'm getting my arm moving, getting the blood flowing, and I'm trying to think generally about where this is going to fit on the page. And so I'm kind of thinking about um, darkening the space around it to leave it, the center area a little bit lighter for now for the where the owl will go. Um, and it's not going to stay this way in terms of the structure, the balance between light and dark. So just some kind of initial thoughts. Um, I also actually I need to have a paper towel handy. So a paper towel can be handy for kind of smoothing, smudging, again building up just layers of tone and we're going to um, come to a gradual resolution of this image. So if you're new, uh, one of the things we talk about in this series is developing a drawing kind of all at once. So rather than finishing one area, moving on to another and finishing that, we're kind of building the whole thing up and we're feeling our way through the subject. Um, the, when, it, when it comes to detail, I like to think about it 
more as an issue of refinement rather than adding detail, if that makes sense. So we're gradually refining the image and we're being selective about where that happens uh, rather than thinking about detail as an added element, as some sort of embellishment in the drawing. So instead, it's a natural part of it. And we as artists gain a certain amount of control over of where that embellish or where those refinement happens, not the embellishment. So, um, so now I'm just kind of filling this whole area in, uh, but I need to give myself a little bit more kind of an indication. I kind of like this strong, this strong line here on the left and then the owl kind of poking out. And so just thinking basi basically in, an, in, ter in the terms of an abstract composition, thinking about that general shape. And then you have this kind of hourglass-like formation over here on the right side. Um, and I like how we generally, we have the shadow up in here and then the owl seems to kind of emerge from that shadow. So it's a very cool photo. It sounds like, Bill, this was in your, your backyard. Um, a few months ago, Margot reached out with this. So um, with this is a subject and I'm glad I hang, hung on to it because it's a pretty awesome subject. Um, so I'm not thinking about being accurate at all in terms of value. I'm thinking mostly in terms of basic value relationships. So lighter and darker versus a specific value. Um, and I kind of, I'm, I'm starting to identify areas where the value range in the reference seems to be very narrow, where it's hard to distinguish in the value. So like right in here, for example, um, and we fall into it a little bit darker on this side, again, where it gets a little bit more subtle. And then we come down here and then this gets bright. But I, as I'm thinking through that, I kind of want this to be a brighter area, which means I don't want a bright value on this side of the page. So to, to kind of create that wash of value, again, I'm just using the side of the pencil, not applying a whole lot of pressure. And each pass, I'm slightly changing the angle. So it's a form of cross hatching where these layers of hatch marks seem to, to vary. And as I'm going, I'm slowly rolling the pencil to kind of round out that lead, technically not lead, but round, round out the core of the pencil so that I don't develop these flat spots. Now with this tape down, it's a little bit hard to contort myself to get in some of these angles, but um, I try to change up the direction. So just using this overhand grip again to, to help me create a wash so I can fill an area fairly quickly. And actually I want to I'm going to darken here. So I'm kind of preserving this area as a brighter white, but you can see I'm, there's no hard edges at this point. This is all about creating these, uh, these layered um, atmospheric planes of value that we're going to gradually refine. And, and in doing that, the, well, the areas where there's a, a harder refinement, a sharper refinement will draw the eye more. Um, and so I've got a basic, basic tonal range established now. So we're going to have a darker, darker region somewhere in here. And so I have, what, what I'm working on is essentially I'm looking at what you're looking at right now. So when I look up, I have this overhead projection and I can see the small thumbnail of the owl right below me. And so that's what I'm working on. And so when I'm looking up, I'm kind of looking up at a kind of a smaller version of this. And I'm thinking about kind of positive and negative space. So the positive space of the owl, the negative space, the shape of that tree behind the owl that forms that shape. And we're gonna kind of feel our way through this. So make some adjustments as we go. Adjusting and correcting is really an essential part of the process. And then one of the things that you might think about too as you're building up these layers of tone is where you put the pressure on your pencil. 
So this is all happening very quickly, but I'm, I'm thinking about each stroke individually and where that pressure is applied. Is it heavier at the start, heavier at the end, heavier in the middle, right? And you might think about trying to create marks that kind of rock over the page a little bit more to create kind of a gentle landing and a lift off of the page. Um, and so when, it, when you're moving even very quickly, you have that general touch that can help to um, create these broad areas of value. Um, and if you're making these initial marks and it's just feeling really chunky, just keep going, keep building up these layers. Um, this is where having a good paper can be really helpful as well. But you can see that I'm not going for a line. I'm not looking for a contour line that we're then filling in. I'm looking for areas of light and dark, giving them a certain amount of mass and weight, um, looking at the overall shape of those areas of light and dark, and then we'll kind of adjust those. But there's, you know, you can start to see that, that rough shape of the owl uh, forming here. It's almost like we're looking through it uh, through frosted glass at the subject. Uh, and I can start to indicate where maybe the, the center of the face might be. And it's a very just, it's a very kind of hazy mark. Uh, it's, I, I don't quite know exactly where it needs to be, so I don't want to create a permanent mark until I've thought through it and that that thinking, that the understanding of this form comes through the drawing process. Um, it can be really challenging to try to have all of the, the forms worked out in your head before you kind of execute the drawing. So in this way, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what we're looking at through the drawing process. We're trying to better understand the subject this way. Um, and so if we, we kind of start with kind of initial understandings of you know, the basic region, where do the eyes live, where does the beak live, and then we continue to adjust and refine and say, all right, we're, we're getting closer each time we could pass through it. I love this shape of the, you know, the rings around the eyes. So at this point, I, I'm just going by gut, by how everything feels. Um, but one of the things that's kind of happening is that as I'm, as I'm making these marks, I'm also doing a mental check-in, where am I relative to other, um, other features in the owl? So as I'm working on this area, I'm doing a quick check-in to see where I am to other areas. And this is still with a light one, so we haven't committed to any darker marks, but we're slowly starting to bring this together. So this one may go, go through fairly quickly. Uh, we'll see how this goes. But I kind of want to just have fun with this one. Um, but again, this is one of the things we talk about a lot on this show, if you're new, is that by building up the entire drawing at once, it puts you in the driver's seat as to what gets the attention. You know, if you want to have more loose and expressive marks, you can do that. If you want to have more detail and refinement, you can do that. Um, so you may be inclined to keep things far looser than what we're, what we're doing here, more expressive, or you may be more inclined to really sit and add those details. Uh, but it's all kind of part of that same process. It, you know, we're, we're in control of where we stop and that, that path, that process. So, all right. So I think I need to start mapping out the proportions a little bit. So this is where we can start to use some tools like comparative measuring and angle sighting. Uh, so if you are new, um, then you're going to want to know what those terms are. If, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with them, We'll kind of talk through it a little bit. So, you know, we're starting with this loose gesture and now we need to continue to refine it. So we're going to slow down our observations a little bit and make some more specific decisions about where things go and what those proportions are. So the first thing we're going to do is angle sighting. So what that means is I have my reference image in front of me and I have the drawing in front of me. 
So if I close one eye, it flattens your depth perception. And when I hold my pencil in front of me, I can align it with the reference photo and, and, and define a particular target. So if I'm looking at this angle of this tree, for example, if that's my target, I'm placing my pencil directly on top of the reference image uh, and aligning that, aligning the, the, the broad angle of the pencil with the angle in the reference photo. I lock my wrist to hold that angle and then bring it across and place it directly on top of the drawing. So again, the drawing is in front of me right now because of this overhead projection. So I can just hold my pencil out, find the angle, carry it over. And in this way, my, my arm is kind of in the way of the, the camera. So I, I need to switch. There we go. So that, in general, you can start to see this angle forming. And I'm thinking about this broad angle rather than getting caught up in all the nuances at this point. I just want to get that basic angle established. And now I can move over to this side and I can start to define the, the angles that, that represent the, the right side of the owl. And again, just breaking it down into these short, straight sections. And the, the advantage to having a, a kind of a gesture on here already is that I have something concrete um, that I can react to, All right? So I can, I can look at the angle that I'm supposed to have and I can see it compared to what I actually have. And in that way, I can make a more specific decision about what needs to change. Um, without any information on the page, it can be difficult to really um, represent the specific angles and proportions accurately right out the ga gate without having something to react to and say it, this needs to be you know higher or lower um, you know steeper or more shallow so I'm going to find the general angle to the head it's pretty close to what I have now because and it's really important that I'm, I'm referring to this what's in front of me the screen that you're seeing to make my evaluations of the angles because if I use this angle here from looking at it in real life for me because the paper is sloped away from me it's distorting the angles that I'm observing my brain is trying to actually correct things um, and and try to straighten things out <laughs> in my own mind and that's that's working against me a little bit so I need to then stand it up and look at it from a distance so if you haven't done that already kind of make sure that you're working vertically so you're confronting the paper directly because again when you lay it down on a table like I'm doing here my brain is mentally adjusting that and it's distorting my perception of the angles so it's really good to continue to check those things All right, now let's see. I'm gonna take the angle of that, that beak, which is pretty close, pretty close, so right in here. Now, so we've talked about angle sighting. Now let's talk about comparative measuring. So what that means is we're gonna compare the width of one element to the height, and we're gonna find something in the, in the reference image that we can use as a standard unit of measure, and we're gonna, gonna compare that to other aspects of the reference. So in this case, for example, we might take the width of the head. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna close one eye against flattening my depth perception, so when I have my pencil in front of me, it appears to be directly on top of the reference and I'm aligning this end here with the right side of the, of the owl. I'm sliding my thumb down until it aligns with the, the left side. And that gives me one unit. And I'm gonna keep this arm outstretched and I'm gonna turn it and I'm gonna compare it to the height. So I'm now aligning this with the top of the owl's head I haven't moved my thumb, so I'm maintaining that measurement. And what I'm observing is that if I take this, this width here and I turn it, then in a, from the distance from the top of the head down here to about the, kind of the start of the, the breastbone for the owl is equivalent to the width of the head. So I'm pretty close to that. Now I need to measure down to see where, where, we, uh, where we need to end the owl at the bottom. So we take a we turn that. And that's just below the beak. Right about here is one measurement. Come down here, and another one is just above where that, that tree root, uh, that, that tree notch emerges. So we turn that one. 
actually this might be a bit more accurate. One, two, so then that the notch in the tree should be somewhere down in here. And now we can, we can start to define that specific shape. So if we have the general width to the height established, uh, now we can start to refine this angle a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend this line down here and the reference follow that line down and that puts me right at the edge of this notch so there's this there's this notch here and then this vertical element comes up right like this and I can take an angle sighting of that initial part and then we have this center area here so we've taken this general angle and we're now we're starting to break that down and then kind of in line with the bottom of the beak that angle slightly changes on the tree to become a bit more vertical and now we can we're going to come over and work on this side here. And what I'm looking at is this angle here. If I extend this, I could see where it intersects here and make sure that, that if I compare that to the reference image that it's um, intersecting at the same spot. So that's about correct there. I think what I need is some a little bit more information here. You get this cool kind of the rough around the neck. I want to establish here uh, because that's kind of throwing off by looking at this mark here which kind of represents the bottom of the beak I was confusing that with some of the marks that are kind of on that that rough around the neck um, and that's distorting then my perception of this part of the body can kind of do some negative drawing as I start to refine this contour edge. I'm thinking about kind of working out from this side here, which is relatively dark. Kind of working on this negative space, working from here up to that edge. And I think I've kind of overdrawn some of this area already. So what I want to do is, is again, start from this side, work my way into that edge, and then I'll come back in with the eraser and redefine that. But I first want to figure out where that path is along that, that contour. Uh, so it's, it's important to kind of know some basic terminology if I'm talking about contour uh, you know, versus edge, you know, so, and, you know, the edges, again, are the edges of the object. And how we treat those edges is really important uh, because, um, you know, having a hard line for an edge or having a value relationship for an edge can change how we interpret that space. If you're going for a sense of realism, in general, you want to try to reduce the amount of lines you're using to find an edge. So a contour line is a line that we use to, to represent the edge of a three-dimensional object. So if I were to draw a line around the shape of this owl, that would rep represent its three-dimensional form. That's a contour line. But if we look at the reference photo, there are no lines there. There's just a, a shift in value from light to dark, and that edge follows a particular path. So what we're looking for are the paths that, these, that the edges will follow along. And, and then we'll be selective about where we need to use a line to represent that edge and where, where we just need a value shift. So now I'm working around kind of the shape of the head. Um, and, and again, what I'm doing is I'm looking at creating a series of short straight marks rather than 
finding a curve and kind of treating it like a circle. I'm looking at a particular portion of that edge and determining what that angle is at that, that place. And then as, as a result, those straight lines accumulate together to create the appearance of a curve. And in doing that, you'll arrive at potentially more of an accurate curve to your drawing rather than try to find that, that specific curve. Because we're going to have a bias towards creating a circle. We're going to look at that circular shape of the head, and it's generally a circle. But if we look at it uh, more precisely, uh, we start to see a, you know, some subtle variations in the shape of the, uh, that circle. It's not a perfect circle. Um, and so you can often become a bit more accurate by starting with a series of straight marks and then rounding them out versus starting with a circle and then try to refine that circle. At least that's what I found for myself. Okay. So I'm, you, know, you can see that I have some of these lines you know, that kind of ring around the eyes. I'm starting to establish those, but I'm a little bit off in those initial placements. So that's, that's what we want. We want to have things to correct at this stage. And make, I, I generally make the assumption that I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> I'm definitely out, out, out of the gate, you know, when I'm starting a drawing. I'm very rarely accurate with my first renderings, my first indication of the marks. So that just becomes part of the process, knowing that we're going to correct and adjust. And so again, by using the side of the pencil, I'm kind of encouraging uh, the creation of shapes over lines. So definitely as, as we get into the head, the a head of the owl, you know, I brought up the idea of contour lines earlier. So as we get into the, the head of the owl, we want to be careful and selective about where we use lines to create those forms. Because if we, be get, if we get too heavy with the use of lines, it's going to break apart the shape, the head of the owl, and it's going to be difficult to put it back together. So what I mean by that, again, is, is when we think about what a contour line is, when we draw a line, it generally represents the edge of a three-dimensional object. So if I start to draw lines in here, it's a cue to the viewer that that's the edge of an object, not an element within the form, if that makes sense. Uh, and so if anything, we want, we want to if we're going to use lines, use it up around the edge and reduce the amount of line work interior to the form because that um, is going to uh, kind of help us maintain a sense of unity. So we're working on really finding that balance between um, the, the marks feeling unified and then breaking up the forms and defining particular aspects of the, of the owl through uh, a variety of marks. If there's, if there's too much variety, then it starts to become visually confusing to the viewer. If there's not enough, then it gets really boring. All right, so these marks here, I need to, I need to kind of lift off a little bit. So just using the eraser on its side, some of these old marks are visually confusing me. It's making it challenging to see what I'm actually doing. And so now I, I, have, I have a larger reference photo up here on my left, so I can start to use that as I come into refinement. But I feel like it's, it's really helpful to use the thumbnail as long as possible to kind of inhibit the, the natural desire to look for details, to dig into those details too early. Again, we're thinking about refining edges over adding detail. And so when we have a, a smaller thumbnail that we're working from or kind of a blurred version or we're intentionally blurring our eyes, uh, what we're doing there is we're, we're forcing ourselves to see the, the whole, the, the, the entire form of the owl rather than um, kind of in, indulging in that, that natural desire to create detail to add detail we want to get to that because that feels so satisfying when you 
when you have that, when you add those details in there. All right, so in this way, we can start to see the, the owl taking shape. I love this kind of black, the way those black uh, feathers kind of halo the, the beak. And again, just keep, keep keeping these marks really soft. And then we're going to gradually sharpen and refine the edges. And I think I want to bring, you know, some sharper detail in there. So now that I've worked in this area, I need to bring a little bit more attention to other aspects of the, uh, of the bird. Start to build up some, uh, you know, more definition. So I can start to think about the, the pattern of the feathers. So using the side of the pencil, can be really helpful when creating the texture here because it, it we have a nice variety of surfaces that we can use right so uh, we have that sharp tip if we want to create a really fine detail but again we're kind of moving into the refinement of those edges so we're saving that sharp point for later um, but as we work with the side of the pencil it you can see it, it's not perfectly straight there's a kind of a slight curve to it which allows us to kind of rock and kind of scrape the that um, that core, the graphite core on the on the paper, and it creates a variety of marks. Um, and as I'm going through, I'm trying to think through the general path that I want the dark lines to follow. So I'm kind of hovering over the the paper to to visualize that path. And then as I come down along that path, I'm kind of creating these marks that that follow along the grain or the texture of those feathers. And and I'm doing that intentionally so that these marks that I'm making feel like they're integrated into the form of the owl. They're part of that form. They're variations in coloring of that um, of those feathers. Uh, and again, if I if I make lines here, if I'm thinking about it as lines, then I run the risk of breaking the owl apart. Again, the viewer will perceive those lines as edges uh, and, and different objects rather than just variations of value of the same form. So I'm kind of gradually kind of indicating some of these areas. And, and in this too, you may be surprised by how descriptive you can get by creating some of these just abstract forms. And then you can start to evaluate what needs additional attention where do i need to really refine even farther and where is it sufficient and as i'm going through this i'm starting to see also in the kind of the details a relationship between positive and negative space so some white feathers on top of brown brown on top of white and so i'm just kind of making a mental note of that to maybe revisit that if i want to add more detail. And so this is all very light in value as well, so I'm conserving the darker values uh, for a little bit later when I, uh, as I'm, you know, as I'm kind of working through the form and wrapping my head around this, uh, this object, the subject, then, you know, I'll come back a little bit later and, and continually refine it. So, um, you know, I'm observing now, for example, that I, I'm not 100% accurate with these patterns of the feathers. And so, and this is again where, you know, you may want to slow down and be a bit more precise, or you may be fine just kind of lightly indicating, be more impressionistic about the, um, the marks that you're making. Uh, one of the things that can be helpful as you're, you're working through it is it can be overwhelming trying to think about capturing all the detail. Again, detail can be a dangerous word. If you think about refinement, it might be a little bit more achievable and a little less intimidating. But as we think about some of these areas here, what can be helpful is just to kind of hold in mind the, the, the abstract qualities of the, the feathers in that area. So we can see that there's a difference in the feathers here versus here versus in the face. And so the if, if we f slow down and we feel like we have to capture each individual feather, it can be really intimidating and overwhelming. 
you know, you may have that that natural inclination, and for you, maybe it, that's totally fine. For me, I get I get claustrophobic thinking about trying to kind of get all of that detail in there. Um, and so instead, I, I'm trying to go for trying to see if I can capture that quality in as few marks really as possible. You know, how can I suggest those forms? And so part of what happens is, you know, just kind of taking in the, the, the quality of, and the texture of those areas. So for example, in this area, they're just shorter and it's kind of smoother, finer grain. And so I might tighten up my marks as I move in this area here. As I come down here, the feathers get a little bit chunkier. And so, and they're, they're kind of layered on top of one another a little bit more kind of closely. You get these almost kind of like this really shallow kind of scallop uh, form. And as we move down here, then it really opens up even more and you have these longer marks. Um, and so I'm just thinking about those qualities, the short, soft, straight, kind of tightly packed, kind of scallop formations in some areas, getting tighter in here, getting longer down in here. And so intentionally varying the marks so that the marks themselves have an abstract quality that in some way references the, the quality of the bird, right? So, um, and in that way, it's, I'm reacting more emotionally to this um, subject rather than descriptively. And then, and out of that, hopefully, then the marks that I'm allowing to flow kind of naturally down the arm kind of capture that quality and the viewer kind of will understand that and, and, and kind of internalize it as well. So hopefully that makes sense. So if I look here for the beak, for, at the beak, for example, the right in here we have this dark patch. In that shape, the quality of the edges, the size of the marks is really unique. It's different than than uh, in other aspects, other areas of the other areas of the head. So there's there, a lot can be described just by kind of feeling the movement, the quality of of that area, almost in a textural sense, and then just trusting that your hand is going to kind of react to that. Um, and and it may take some time, you know, maybe it may take some experimentation to kind of build up that hand-eye coordination, but that's part of what drawing develops. And it's important to have a, a mindset of, of practicing and developing and evolving rather than mastering, if that makes sense. Um, you know, mastery comes through a whole lot of experimentation and, and practice and just sheer time. You know, some of us, we, we tend to kind of start at different points in that mastery scale. So some of us are naturally a little bit farther along than others, but drawing really is just a skill that anyone can learn. Um, you know, like I said, there are some, some qualities that just come a little bit more naturally to others, to some people than others, but, um, and, and it may be that, you know, you have a natural kind of inclination to one, one aspect of drawing, but not others. And I think it's really, it's really an important part of my practice to maintain a sense of discovery, almost like you, you want to try to discover something new about um, drawing, about the materials, about the subject, about yourself, anything, something new that you discover with each drawing. Of course, that doesn't happen all the time, but that's, that's the general pursuit. All right, so I think I can shift now to this darker graphite. So I'm gonna kind of wipe everything down, just using the palm of my hand, or you can use a paper towel like I've got here. Kind of just crumpled that up in my, as a, like a stress ball in my left hand. But, um, and what that does is it just helps kind of unify the marks. And so as I go through, I like to kind of wipe it down, build up divisions on the page, make marks on the page that represent the subject wipe it down, build it up again, wipe it down, and you kind of keep going through that cycle of creating marks that define the subject um, and then unifying it. So, all right, so let me switch to the 6B now, I think. This, so this is, it should be quite a bit darker. And now that I have a better understanding about the, the proportions, and I'm feeling generally pretty good about it, um, 
you know, I think w there's definitely some areas where I need Im improvement and I'll continue to adjust as we go through. But as long as I'm kind of in the ballpark, I should be good. And so I'm still using the side of the pencil to build up these broad areas. And I'm squinting my eyes to help identify value relationships. So if you squint your eyes at your subject and you're observing value relationships, if you squint your eyes and something just kind of disappears, an edge disappears, that's an indication that those values are actually very close to one another. When we bring our, our eyes into sharp focus, we tend to heighten those value contrasts. So that's really important to kind of shift back and forth between a sharp focus and that blurred vision kind of squinting and shutting down um, some of that, that light entering your eyes because um, you know, in here, for example, when I squint, so much of this detail fades away in the reference photo. And that's an indication to me that those value relationships are very subtle. When I, when I look at it closely, I can see all of these nuances, you know, these subtle variations in, in value, these stripes, the, you know, the shape of the eye, etc. But then, again, when I squint, it all just kind of fades away. And the, the, you know, the truth in your drawing is going to be kind of somewhere in between there. And so by squinting, you're kind of putting yourself in check and then by, by focusing, you're, um, you're kind of, again, heightening those value relationships a bit. Uh, so then here, I'm observing that there's a very subtle value contrast here. When I squint, it, that edge largely disappears. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the drawing just kind of reflect that as well. Just become kind of softer, more atmospheric there. And as we will look for more kind of specific features and defining edges, it's important to kind of do a check-in. Uh, so as I'm looking, as I'm working over here, I do a quick check-in. I have the eyes kind of lightly indicated to make sure kind of I'm generally in the right spot. So right down in here, we start to get a sharper edge. And I'm using these short kind of circular marks in that background uh, because they're omnidirectional. Um, if anything, you know, we have this edge is largely vertical. So if anything, you want to try to turn your marks on the, the, this wood here uh, so that they're generally perpendicular. That creates a division, right? And we want to create that separation between the owl and the tree. Um, if these marks here parallel the shape of the bird, it's going to confuse the viewer's mind and it's going to naturally attach the two together. The viewer's going to look at that and say, if, well, if we have this path here and these marks follow that same path, then they must belong together. When actually there should be some separation between them. There, there are two different aspects, two different elements. So sometimes just changing the direction of your marks can make a big impact in how the object of the subject is perceived. Those little things can make a big difference in your drawing. I think I might kind of naturally darken some of this a little bit more. So we'll do some negative drawing as well to, you know, use, we'll pull out some of the lights with the eraser here in a little bit. I think right now I want to kind of refine this edge. So as, I, as I'm looking at that edge, I'm kind of working back and forth. I'm working, really drawing the tree. And then in that negative space, the shape of that bird is going to emerge. So kind of working back and forth up to that edge. And you can see I have this modified overhand grip. So I have, I have it wedged between my fingers and then I can stabilize it with my fingertips. So it's kind of like the tripod grip. This is you know, how we normally write, right? So you have a certain amount of control that way. But if you, if you hold it like this, it allows you to use the side of the pencil to create those broad marks. And as you come up to the, to the edge, you can just kind of roll your hand a little bit. And you can engage the tip of the pencil a little bit more to get more precision out of that edge. Uh, and you may find a, a completely different way of holding the, the pencil too. So that's, that's just the, the method that I use because it can be difficult to try to break that that habit of just using that one tripod grip, and for you know many there are many great artists out there that that's all how they hold a pencil, right? You know they 
you don't even necessarily have to have variety there, but for me, it's kind of an essential part of the process is changing the grip up. Um, but so you might find it kind of freeing to have some variation there. So I started, I started to create these marks again that are paralleling that path at the edge of the bird and I was kind of, I need to, to rein myself in there a little bit, got to change those directions a little bit. So there's this one little feather that kind of sticks out. I don't want to capture, but I'm kind of sneaking up on it, kind of closing in the space around it. Not sure if it's quite in the right spot, but I'm, so I'm kind of exaggerating it a little bit in the drawing, but I think I want to keep it because it's a fun one. And as I'm working on this, this section here, I'm intentionally kind of lifting away from the bird. There's kind of a dreamlike quality already emerging that I kind of like. And if you're kind of selective about where you refine the edges, they can create a sense of atmosphere. Um, and, you know, that it can be kind of an artificial decision. You know, you may just decide to, where to sharpen it based on some sort of abstract design concept, or it can be based on direct observation, you know, letting, you know, letting the, your observation of the subject define for you where you sharpen up the edges. So like right in here, for example, that edge gets really soft. I kind of lose that side of the, the bird. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to let that just happen in here. And instead what I'm going to do is actually sharpen up the edge of the tree. So you know, here we worked on this dark area and on the left side, we kind of sharpened the edge of the, the feathers there. Now we're going to work on this area where the dark spot is going to define the shape of the tree. So I'm kind of working out now on the owl, kind of darkening, kind of tightening up along this left edge to sharpen up that edge. I'll let that kind of feather out there, pun intended. So squinting again to prioritize value relationships. <laughs> you know, I kind of all that I had done all that work in there earlier now it's all just gone it's kind of lost in the uh, the feathers there I lost the feathers there in that darkness but I like the way he's kind of poking out from the that light a little bit more from the shadow So now let's see, what do I want to do here? Kind of refine a little bit that top of the head, the head right here. Uh, now with the graphite, one of the things I'm noticing is that the, you know, the light here in this room is reflecting off of the graphite in an interesting way. So from looking at it from here, I can't really see the marks that I'm making. Um, so again, I need to kind of look at the vertical, the overhead projection there. Uh, because that helps me to see what's actually happening. All right, so let me kind of indicate the beak with the eraser here. And I'm kind of overstating that. I'm erasing out too much of it. find that all right 
we're doing pretty well on time. Now this is I like I kind of like the the moodiness that's uh, that's kind of emerging under this drawing. So I didn't really quite have a vision for how this would all come together, you know, prior to this. So right in here, it's like there's, we have these two kind of circular patterns, you know, formations of the feathers that, that come together. So as you're working on this dark spot, think about it both simultaneously as a positive space as well as a negative shape. So, I'm kind of working my way around the eyes, so kind of setting the stage for the eyes a little bit. And so you might find it helpful to, again, kind of visualize the path so in this case, we have this path that forms this kind of ring. You can give yourself kind of light indications of it, but then really you're making marks that are more permanent by following the grain of the feathers there. I can feel the, uh, this pencil lead is broken. <laughs> so there's a little wobbly quality to it. Um, it seems to be holding up all right, so but I have to be careful with the amount of pressure that I apply to it because it'll just snap off any moment. So it's one of the benefits to having then the other one that's sharp and ready to go. And so as I'm, as I'm working down on this side, again, the value relationships get really subtle. This is a three-dimensional form that's wrapping back into space. And so I am observing how the kind of the patterns and the owl kind of wrap behind there and just trying to let them kind of fall along that, that cross contour of the bird. That cross contour being marks that, that are on the form of the object that represent its three-dimensional form. And I really like this paper for working with graphite. Now it's a kind of a, it's a rag paper so it, there's a softness to it uh, that I think is working out really well. I think it's important to kind of experiment with different, different papers. And as you're working on these kind of darker areas, the patterns, kind of do a quick check-in you know, make sure you're in, kind of in the right spot. So now I can, um, I can start to refine the eye. So I'm switching to this, this tripod grip. So that's using the tip of the pencil, which is creating these fine lines. And I, again, I need to be careful about these and observe what's happening to it so that I, I want to make sure that it's adhering to the form. So as I refine these edges, as these details are emerging, that the, any sort of detail, any sort of refinement is in service of the form, that it's not kind of a detail for detail's sake, but instead it's, it's continuing to reinforce the structure and form of the bird. So just, they're just refined a little bit farther than some other areas. Because uh, sometimes what can happen is that detail can be so enticing um, and we want to jump to it, but if we don't, if it doesn't kind of adhere to the, the form, then it, it becomes visually confusing for the viewer rather than adding to the experience. So now I'm trying to observe the specific shape of the eye. Um, so again, breaking it down into a series of shorter, kind of straight marks. And uh, there's that little highlight in there, but I'm not, well, maybe I can kind of work my way around it. So, uh, I didn't really do a very good job of that. So I'm just kind of creating that black form. And, and 
as we come out of the eye, th observing the, the pattern of the feathers and how they kind of radiate out from it, from the eye. And we'll kind of establish that a little bit more too. So yeah, now as you're, as you're gonna work on your marks, keep thinking about them abstractly. You know, think about the, you know, the large marks, soft, hard, things like that. You know, what are the qualities of the marks that um, give you some information about the, the subject? All right, so now I'm gonna kind of work on this left side, I, and I like it. Kind of, I'm gonna think I'm gonna leave everything here fairly abstract. Just bring this into focus and add a few more details. So we're actually getting pretty close to the end here. Uh, so similar to the that other eye, I'm just kind of setting the stage here. I'm switching to this overhand grip because that's, you can see I've kind of lost the sharp point on the pencil. So by shifting to this overhand grip, I'm actually sharpening the pencil as I go. And I don't need that fine line here. So try to visualize the path and then and kind of drop the marks along that path. And so as we, you know, we're gonna go through and continue to refine this. Now, I wanna, I think I need to, I need to kind of massage this transition a bit so that it, we understand that, that the form of the feathers continues into that darkness. So I need to add a little bit more of a suggestion back in here. these patterns here. So as we think about the three-dimensional object of the bird's head, you know, as we wrap around the head, across the top of the head, we're, we're looking across that flat surface. So those variations uh, in color just become these thin lines. And as we come down the, along the face, those marks become more open. We're looking at them directly. Uh, so the shape of those marks um, becomes really important in, um, in suggesting that three-dimensional form. So again, this is where, you know, as we continue to refine and those details emerge, we want it to be in service of the, of the form of the bird there. All right, so as we come across, I'm gonna place that other eye, and I've got, I've got a few things that, that need to, um, align in order for it to work. So it needs to fit within this, the this eye socket that the, the kind of the pocket that's emerged for there, and it needs to align with this eye. So I'm trying to be aware of both of those things at the same time. Uh, so looking back and forth between the reference image and the drawing. Um, you know, one of the things I, I remember, you know, I, I would talk a lot about with students is, you know, is kind of think about how much time you're actually spending looking at the reference and how much time you're looking at the drawing and how much time you're actually drawing. So you have those three aspects of the process. There's observing the subject, there's drawing, and then observing your drawing. Um, and, and ask yourself, you know, kind of take mental note of what that ratio looks like for you. Um, because I, you know, for some of you, you may take quick glances at the reference photo and then it just becomes all about the drawing, right? You know, it's kind of just, it, it, maybe it's, you know, 75% of your time you're looking at the drawing, you're drawing and looking at the drawing, and then 25% of the time you're looking at the reference photo. Um, and there are, uh, you know, the, for me, 
I like to think more of it about, you know, try to think about two thirds of the time actually looking in the reference photo and looking at the drawing, or maybe three quarters of the time looking at the reference in the drawing, and 25% of the time actually drawing. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I know that's gonna change from time to time, and you might call me out on it and say, well, you're, you're spending way more time drawing, but think about, think about what you're, you're doing there. I remember at, at this Monet exhibit here in, in Denver a few years back, they had a video, and you could find it online, a video of Monet painting the uh, you know, water lilies on location. So he had this big canvas up and he's painting the water lilies. Um, and if you watch that video, you know, it, his, he'll kind of look, look at the painting, look at the subject, look at the painting, and then make a mark. And then back and forth, back and forth, looking at the reference, looking at the painting, and then making a mark. So many glances at the subject in order to get that mark. Um, the And you know, so if you're kind of struggling with, with accuracy, if you're making these drawings uh, and you want it to look like the reference, and then that might, it might be helpful for you to think about like, what is that ratio? How much time are you actually really studying the subject? And how much time are you observing your own drawing? What's actually happening on the page? Versus how much time are you getting absorbed in the mark making? Uh, I know for me, you know, when I first started drawing, it was a thing where I would glance at the subject and then I would be gone. I'd be in the, in the drawing just looking at all the marks I'm making, all working from this mental snapshot that I had taken in a split second at the start of the whole process. So I'd look at the reference, take this mental snapshot, quickly hold that in my mind, and I'd use that to feed the next two hours of this drawing. And it's really hard to understand a subject in that split second. Um, but if you really slow things down, take time to really observe the subject, then you're going to find that I think your, your drawing is going to become that much more informed and more precise as a result of that. So um, again, just something to kind of think about in your own process. Um, you know, I don't want to make assumptions about your work without having seen it, but if you might find that helpful if, again, if, if you're, if you're going for accuracy, if you're going for it to look like your subject, just kind of understand where, where you're prioritizing your time. So as I'm adding, adding these details, you can see I'm kind of supporting, I kind of have to support this, this is getting a little bit wobbly in here, it's kind of feels like a loose tooth. Um, so I'm supporting that with my, my finger, and I'm intentionally using the side of the pencil. The side of the pencil can create some really beautiful, fine details and just kind of observe the paths of these patterns in the, in the feathers and just kind of letting it skip across the page, letting it roll in my fingers uh, to, to kind of get to a new part of that, that graphite core. And and in this way, I'm just kind of, I'm actually being a little bit more gestural. And when I'm making my observations, I'm trying to identify, I know where I need to look in the reference. So I take a glance and I'm looking specifically at an area, taking a mental uh, kind of calculation, try to connect with something in that area, and then try to execute it. And then back at the reference, back at the drawing, back and forth, looking at the reference, looking at the drawing. But when I'm looking at the reference, there's, uh, there is something specific that I'm looking for in that one area. I'm not trying to take in the entire thing. I'm looking at that one area, making note of it. And because I have the overall proportions established and the form of the bird is emerging, I don't have to really worry too much about those, those refined areas kind of fitting properly, all right? So I can now absorb myself in those details and I can be a little bit more confident that the, um, that the whole thing is going to fit together, that the, I'm not going to lose the forest for the trees. And then this, this technique of using the side of the pencil, letting it kind of just rock in my hand, it creates kind of more naturally formed marks. They feel like shadows or variations in, in coloring on the feathers rather than 
rather than lines. And again, you can, you can create some really sharp edges using the side of the pencil. We often kind of default to wanting to use the tip at the point of the pencil. But with fine line work, if you're rolling your pencil, this is a cylindrical form, form. And so because it's a cylinder, it's a rounded form, there's only going to be a very fine point of contact on the page. So it creates this beautiful kind of sharp edge without using the tip of the pencil. And so there's kind of like a, there's a technique to this where I'm kind of washing kind of lightly across the page um, to find the, the general path. And then these quick kind of vibrations, vertical vibrations that help to simulate the, the feathers a little bit. I kind of lost, I don't think I placed the pattern of these feathers accurately. That's all right. Cool. It's enough to give you the idea, and then hopefully you'll launch off of this and create tremendous artwork. And so again, if you're, if you're kind of new to watching this, you know, this is... You know, drawing together as a show where we typically meet live every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, because of scheduling issues, I'm not able to meet live this week, so I'm posting this recording for all of you that follow along. We get people that, that join in from all over the world, um, and it's really exciting to, to create a community just around drawing. You know, people, you know, we all just recognize that drawing is really a helpful practice to continue as an artist to help feed so many other skills and you know it's a you know it's a wonderful art form in itself um, and it it's a skill that you can apply to any other media so I use it in my oil painting you know, this helps to build hand-eye coordination um, it helps to kind of lock in certain um, a certain habits with regards to controlling proportions and value, things like that. All right, so I'm, I'm so as I so I'm working on these these patterns. It's again, it's it's about using the it's using the side of the pencil and the shapes there to create the marks. And I think I need a little bit more weight here on the this kind of neck. There's this band of darkness right along in here that I really like. But I, it's not, I haven't captured all of the details, but that's all right. Um, what do I want to do? I think in here I want to... All right, so now I'm going to use my eraser and actually, do I have one that's a little bit sharper? Ah, this one's better. So this one here is a little bit sharper. I've got, so you can take a razor blade and you can carve off the end to give yourself a nice sharp point. And I'm going to observe where the, I want the light to be a little bit stronger because right now there's this there's a tone across the page and I can tell my, my brain is kind of calibrated to that. I'm seeing these light areas and I'm, I'm thinking that they're white. So now let's see what what actually emerges out of this. I'm going to start with the beak. I'm going to give it a little bit more form by pulling off some of the light right on the tip of the, the beak. Kind of erase that out. I don't know. Something seems a little off there. I need to I need to bring the the beak over a little bit. So make some adjustments there. There we go. Kind of straighten that out a little bit more. And so with this sharp edge, you can also kind of suggest the texture of the feathers. So just like a drawing tool, you know, you're, this is a, 
the, an eraser is not just a tool for correction. It's a, you're contributing to the form. And I'm thinking I'm going to leave this all to be in shadow. But where he's kind of poking his head out, where he's catching the light a little bit more, I can um, I can add some more detail, observe these light patches. I'm letting this edge just kind of fade away to help create a sense of depth and volume. So it doesn't look like I really needed to use the, the kneaded eraser. And right in here, you can use the eraser to kind of reinforce the uh, the, the, the texture here, the, the, the current grain of the feathers a little bit. And actually, right in here, I think I need to add... Uh, I need to add some of these marks in here, a little bit more variation. Now this this is a little bit flat in here, so I can add a little bit more more texture. And again, if you're now that we're in that stage, I'm thinking about refining more than adding detail. So just ref where do I need to refine it farther to bring more life to the subject? And I think I want to add some in here. Just going to kind of give these quick indications of where the light might be a little bit stronger. Not too sharp of an edge because I don't want to have a, a hard edge along in there. I, I want that to, to feel rounded. Let that thing wrap around into the, the background there. And in here, light catches up a little bit more. And across the top here where the light, again, where the light catches a bit. So a lot of a lot of details missing, but again, I think we're capturing the overall essence of this bird. But again, if you follow this process, hopefully, you know you can take this as far as you want. So if you want to add all that that the nice contrasting texture of the bark against the feathers, then go for it. You know, or if you if you think you're think it's fine the way it is. Oh, actually, it looks like I was using the six B that whole time, so I can switch to that eight B. Who knew? I'm sure some of you observed that and were yelling at the screen and say, you're not using the 8B, you're using the 6B. Now I'm using the 8B, is that right? Yeah, 8B, okay. In general, I like to use the softer graphite um, and then you know create variations in value through a modulation of texture. That's just kind of my preferred method. Um, I like the softness and the smoothness of a, of a soft graphite over the scratchy quality of a, of a harder one. But I think that's a part of that could just be user, user error on my part. <laughs> you know, I could probably just need to learn how to use a harder graphite you know, a little bit better. And then a lot of people that really enjoy, um, you know, in intentionally controlling the values through the selection of, um, you know, for various, you know, graphite. You know, going from the the two B, you know, to the jumping to the two H or the four H. You know, using the the H's for lighter values, the B's for darkers. But again, I kind of I don't like to switch around too much once I'm kind of locked in. 
to the drawing. I like to try to sit with one and try to, again, modulate the values through control of pressure versus um, a, a changing of the, of the graphite. I'm just kind of bringing a little bit more contrast up in here. This is a really cool bird. So I want to thank you for providing this. Uh, again, photo credit for this goes to Bill Miller. Okay, hopefully I got that right. Margo, thank you for sending this. Happy birthday to Liz. Um, so I think, but I think we've pretty much, I think we've pretty much got taken this as far as it's really necessary for this bird. I hope you will all join me again every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. You can find all of the, the past episodes on our YouTube channel or on artistnetwork.com where we have a page dedicated to the show. Each show has its own page on Artist Network uh, where you can share your work with the growing community of artists. This is all about just us getting together, sharing ideas about drawing, um, being open, being vulnerable, to sharing the mistakes that are bound to happen. It's not about showing off our perfection. This is about just enjoying the process because we believe that drawing is an important thing for us to do. So um, this is a safe place for anybody who wants to just kind of experiment and jump right in. Um, and again, you may have a completely different outlook on drawing, a totally different process, and we want to hear it. So, um, uh, as I add these final highlights, being careful not to make that highlight brighter than this one, but it's difficult. Kind of overstating that a little bit. But yeah, I think I'm happy with this. this is a, I think it's a fun bird to draw and I like, again, that kind of moody quality that we're creating here. So again, thank you all for joining me. Hopefully you've enjoyed drawing this owl. Again, you'll find the reference image in the link below and uh, I'd love to see your work when you're done. So post that to the site. Um, we'll see you all in a week with the next episode. Uh, and we'll be get that posted as soon as possible so you know exactly where we're headed. So again, thank you all. This has been a blast. Happy drawing.